now we can start. <laughs> Welcome to the National Organization for Rare Disorders webinar on who's left out, recognizing barriers and building an inclusive community. Our second webinar in our DEI series for rare disease nonprofits. My name is Debbie Drell and I'm NORD's Director of Membership and your facilitator for this meeting. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm a second generation Mexican American with both parents born in Mexico. When it comes to rare disease nonprofits, we all have a powerful and important role to play in helping to improve health disparities and ensuring that those who have been left out are brought into the community and are able to receive equitable access to the resources and support they deserve. Today, we will discuss strategies for building stronger, authentic relationships with marginalized communities and best practices for inclusion as you're developing your program, events, outreach, and collaborating with industry on research and clinical trials. This webinar, including the entire diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility series is open and accessible to the community at large to help inspire nonprofit leaders to take action. As a reminder, this meeting features live Spanish translation. So please use this feature if it's helpful to you. This meeting is being recorded and will be made available shortly after the webinar. NORD's mission. NORD is an independent nonprofit leading the fight to improve the lives of rare diseases, uh, rare disease patients and families. As you can see, our mission is here on the slide. Leaders of NORD's 330 member organizations are entitled to all the resources NORD provides for their capacity building and for their impact of their mission. Next slide, please. Thank you to our sponsors for helping to support this effort and uh, our educational series. Next slide, please. This uh, group of ladies is NORD's membership team. We are working for you. NORD's mission is your mission. If you're involved in a nonprofit organization, if you want to start a nonprofit, if you're interested in taking the leap from a Facebook group to a nonprofit, this is what we do. We help strengthen and build new leaders and current leaders in the rare disease community. During this webinar, a topic may be raised, which may prompt you to think of a question that isn't specifically addressed. We only have a short period of time. You can email us membership at rarediseases.org if you have any questions. Next slide. If you're a nonprofit organization and you're not taking full advantage of NORD's membership, uh, we encourage you to do so. NORD's membership has a lot of benefits, including a private Facebook group of 460 nonprofit leaders who crowdsource their questions, legal issues, uh, looking for templates and other resources, drug development questions, grant opportunities. It's a great group. It's moderated. It's uh, for NORD members. We offer hundreds of dollars in scholarship for participation at our conferences and registration at other conferences, including the World Orphan Drug Congress. Board source membership helps you manage your board of directors. That's a $3,500 annual subscription, depending upon your organization's revenue, um, but that we give those away to our member organizations as well. And then there's all the resources that NORD has uh, helping you to navigate NIH, FDA, and um, other government regulatory bodies. And then our staff, we're here to help you. If you're not an NORD member, reach out to us, membership at rarediseases.org. Next slide, please. So I'm kind of running through the script quickly. Um, we have talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion in the last two webinars that you may have watched. This um, diversity, equity, and inclusion has a very specific meaning, meaning, and I'll share what this means. Taken from the US Food and Drug Administration and the Ford Foundation, uh, we define diversity as representation of all individual attributes and identities. And that includes the litany of um, attributes and identities, including race, ethnicity, gender, disability, and so forth. And it's not just these identities and attributes, it's collectively as well as individually. And we believe that when we prioritize diversity, we're able to help our organizations and our members and our patient communities best represent their missions and their goals efficiently and effectively. Equity is defined as the fair treatment, equality of opportunity, and equality of access to information and resources. Inclusion refers to, and you'll learn a lot more about it today with our wonderful speakers, but inclusion refers to behaviors and actions that create a culture of belonging and a sense of value for all who participate and contribute, while at the same time understanding no one person can 
or should be asked to represent their entire community. Next slide. So we do have um, three webinars and all of the information being shared is going to be um, the basis of a toolkit that will have even more resources, links that you can jump to, to deep dive into particular topic areas, worksheets that you can pass to your board of directors or to your staff, activities that will help you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So think of these webinars as a supplement to this larger training resource through our toolkits. Next slide. So here's the agenda. I'm giving some general updates, um, but we do have a slate of speakers who you see on the screen. Um, they will speak for 30 minutes and then we will have breakouts and you've been assigned breakouts based upon your registration, but you can also move out of rooms. Um, if you are more comfortable communicating in Spanish, you can stay in this room and not move to any of the other rooms. Um, but this room that is the main room is our Spanish language breakout room. Now, without further ado, and thank you for your patience in waiting, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Um, and actually, I'll just present, I'll just introduce Dr. Yolanda Avent first, and then she will pass the virtual microphone on to the next speaker, Ashley Ferreira. Dr. Avent is the founder and CEO of Avent Diversity Consulting. She is um, an incredible expert at diversity, equity, and inclusion. And she will, um, and she has been speaking in this webinar series on DEI. And uh, I'm excited to welcome her. And she will also be in one of the breakout rooms. Dr. Avent, thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Debbie. I'm so excited to be here um, with you all today and excited about the topic of this webinar. So again, my name is Dr. Yolanda Avent, and I serve as the CEO and founder of Avent Diversity Consulting. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I do prefer my name. Um, and I list for you some of my primary identities being a Black woman, which is very uniquely tied for me and part of my world lens. Also being a mother and a learner, and an old school hip hop enthusiast is a piece of who I am as well. So I share those with you because we all come from different lenses, right? And as we think about the backgrounds that we come from, it's important from a self-identity perspective to know who you are and how that impacts and interacts with the world. So this is a favorite quote of mine. It is not our differences that divide us. It is our inability to recognize, accept, and celebrate those differences. And that is from Audrey Lord. So there's information here on also how you can um, contact us. But I think as we go forward and we think about inclusion, next slide, please. Inclusion is really the heartbeat and should be the heartbeat of your organization. So thinking about how you engage people, how you engage your audiences, your communities, how you retain people once they come into your networks, how you build trust, which is so important in all systems and organizations, but thinking about how you build trust and also how you fulfill your mission. So when we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, sometimes we stop at diversity and we forget to move forward with inclusion and equity and even accessibility. All those pieces are going to be important and it can be overwhelming. And so my advice to you is to take it one step at a time, but just don't stop. So diversity is a fact. Inclusion is an action. Equity is a choice and belonging ideally is the outcome you will have if you put these things in place. So thinking about diversity as that composition of difference, inclusion being how do people feel respected? What does implicit bias look like in your organization? What do microaggressions look like in your culture? And then take time to assess your culture and your climate. And then equity is helping to dismantle those systems that have um, been in favor of groups in your organization and may have not favored others. And then again, at the end of the day, we want belonging. We all want to feel like we belong authentically and that we're respected. So I thank you. I'm excited to be a part of the breakout rooms and the other ADC consultants that are here today. And at this point, I would like to pass it out to our next speaker, Janet. Thank you so much. I will go. Oh, Jeanette, there we go. Never mind. Shall I just go? Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you being here and we have your slides going. So we'd love to hear more uh, about your experiences with inclusion and ASCO. Great. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm Jeanette Merrill, uh, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm the Director of Policy Programs here at the American Society of Clinical Oncology and just appreciate the opportunity to share a few things that the organization has been doing to integrate a, a focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion across cancer care and everything that we do. Next slide, please. Um, so again, just uh, I know I've got 10 minutes and I'm going to kind of throw the water hose at you, um, but I hope to briefly describe ASCO's commitment to equity in cancer care, um, provide an overview of how those disparities are impacting cancer care and outcomes and share a couple of details on some um, high level project projects we have, including an initiative with the um, Association of Community Cancer Centers, as well as our own work to address disparities and equities in cancer care for LGBTQ plus populations. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about who we are. Um, ASCO is the world's leading professional organization for physicians and oncology professionals caring for people with cancer. We're a 501c3 nonprofit founded back in 1964. We do have a global membership of nearly 45,000 oncology professionals, and that includes physicians, researchers, patient advocates, nurses, and anybody who is involved in cancer care globally. Uh, next slide, please. So just going back again to that, that start in 1964, equity and diversity has been integral to ASCO since our beginning. You can see there one of our members, our founding members was Dr. Jane C. Wright, an African-American woman recognized as being one of the pioneers of chemotherapy and also saw the value of enrolling patients in clinical trials, which is very integral to the work that I'm going to talk about today. Next slide, please. Um, just really want to highlight here, um, uh, you know, that that ASCO's original mission statement was conquering cancer through re research, education, and promotion of the highest quality patient care. And in 2020, largely um, with, with the leadership of our board president at the time, Dr. Lori Pierce, you can see we added the term equitable in patient care um, to make sure, again, that it is a focus pillar of everything we do. Next slide, please. Um, so adverse differences in the number of new cancer cases, death, and burden exist among certain groups and populations, and that has been well documented related to biological and genetic differences. But others like environmental factors are also important, and we cannot ignore others like behavioral and healthcare factors, as well as modifiable risk factors, communities, and habits that contribute to these cancer disparities, such as attitudes, beliefs, language, communication, food and eating habits, smoking habits, um, mental processes and learning styles, attitudes, beliefs, and certainly socioeconomic status and education. Next slide, please. And some of these uh, most more common differences are uh, reported by the NIH and the CDC. I'm not going to go through this just for time, but you can see there um, certainly African American men and women have that higher risk of um, prostate cancer and breast cancer breast cancer. We see Hispanic children and adolescents more likely to develop leukemia. Um, and, you know, men living in, in Kentucky, just showing there where geography can, can really play in um, the men living in Kentucky have that uh, high incidence of uh, cancer death. Next slide, please. So even though technological developments in cancer screening and treatment methods have improved mortality rates, the data shows the socioeconomic differences are either unchanged or expanding. And many of the disparities we're discussing stem from these social and structural factors, which have led to policy and programs that exclude or isolate certain populations. Some of these disparities are due to consequences of individual behaviors, but there are also those that exist because of structural conditions. And so combined efforts at various levels such as government healthcare policies, efforts by medical institutions and local initiatives are necessary. Next slide, please. So this brings me back to ASCO's efforts. Um, again, sort of equity, diversity, inclusion, you see there are efforts, um, equity culturally embedding, responding, accommodating differences in policies, diversity, uh, raising awareness and respect and celebration of people, thoughts and ideas, and inclusion, giving voice and power to build and sustain organizational culture. Next slide, please. 
So here at ASCO, that this is a representative of how we're working to integrate everything we do um, with our members. We're looking at diversity inclusion in the workplace and workforce, um, looking at the, the membership and making sure that when we have volunteer opportunities, they are not only representative of our broad membership, but also working to make sure that our membership is reflective of the workforce and ultimately that the workforce is representative of the population they're treating. And with our uh, cancer patients, certainly looking at how ASCO can support the delivery of equitable care and, and addressing access issues and certainly access to research and research participation. And then inwardly, we are making sure that everything we do outside is also supported by and, and uh, supportive of our staff internally. Next slide, please. So back in 2020, we did release um, our second cancer disparities and health equity statement. The original was published in 2009. Um, so this came just about a decade later, later. And the biggest difference was the statement in 2009 tended to document the disparities. And our goal here with the statement in 2020 was moving from beyond just documenting to moving toward action. Um, and so there are a number of high level goals you can see there, but I want to focus the remainder of my time here on that last uh, goal of ensuring, ensuring equitable uh, research. Uh, next slide, please. Just briefly here, I want to touch on one of ASCO's own clinical trials, and that is TAPER, which is the Targeted Agent and Profiling Utilization Registry. Uh, this study is a non-randomized clinical trial that aims to describe the performance of Food and Drug Administration approved targeted anti-cancer drugs prescribed for treatment of patients with advanced cancer that has a potentially actionable genomic alteration. And you can see there, maybe despite some of our best efforts, we are not having any other than, than what you see um, consistently with uh, diverse participation of minority patients in this trial. Next slide, please. So to address that, we have uh, an initiative, again, that was launched with the ACCC. This was an initiative um, led by our own board president, Dr. Lori Pierce, and the board president of ACCC at the time, Randall Oyer, um, designed to increase participation of underrepresented patients in clinical uh, cancer treatment trials. Next slide, please. So this uh, this. Sorry, excuse me. Um, this effort has, has a primary goal, again, of increasing the participation among patients from racial and ethnic groups. The primary focus is on Black and Hispanic or Latino, Latina patients. Um, we initially requested ideas back in July 2020, and happy to say that we had 75 sites um, self identify and, and um, apply to participate, and we were able to accept all 75 sites into this um, pilot project. Just want to note that the trials themselves, we are not offering a trial to patient. This is focused on the clinical sites and giving them the tools and resources to then increase the, the participation in the trials that they are currently running. So this looks at the improvement along that whole continuum of trials of screening patients, offering patients trial, which is very important and not always done, the patients consenting, and then patient retention. Uh, next slide, please. And if you want to click one more time or keep clicking, sorry, didn't realize that was all there. Um, so there's really two sides to this effort. One is the site assessment, and this is building a tool for sites to understand who's walking through their door. So if a site is in a community that is 80% Black or African American, but 80% of their um, patient population is white, then how do they get the, the patients that are in their catchment area through their door? And then how do they get those patients onto trial? So that is allowing them to assess who's walking through their door, who they're treating versus who's in their immediate catchment area. Um, and the other side of that is implicit bias training. Um, this is modeled after some training through Duke University called Just Ask. And it's making sure that providers are just asking patients and it eliminates eliminates that bias that a provider might have, whether they think a patient may or may not accept trial and just asking if they'd like to go on to trial. Uh, next slide, please. 
So switching gears a little bit, but very important is around the data collection uh, where we have a huge gap and that is in um, support of the LGBTQ population, especially cancer patients. Um, we know there's a growing body of evidence that LGBTQ plus populations are increased risk of cancer and poor outcomes. Some of that is due to increased smoking, alcohol use um, and obesity, but we know that these patients also report a lower satisfaction with cancer care treatment, higher rates of psychological distress and survivorship, they're less likely to have insurance coverage and certain higher rates of perceived, perceived discrimination in the healthcare setting. Next slide, please. Um, so just more representative data here that uh, cancer screening rates for transgender individuals versus non-transgender individuals, 70% uh, lower for breast cancer, 60% lower for cervical cancer, 50% lower for colon cancer, and 23% of respondents in this particular survey reported they did not seek needed health care in the year due to fear of being treated, mistreated as a transgender person. Next slide, please. So in 2017, ASCO did issue a position statement um, around reducing cancer health disparities among sexual and gender minority patients or populations. Um, we tend to use the SGM acronym, which is um, the NIH uh, really inclusive definition, but I know it's not well known outside of, of the research community, so I will vacillate a little bit as I go forward. Um, the goal of this statement was really to issue sound recommendations around patient education support Support, supporting workforce development and diversity, quality improvement strategies, policy solutions, and research strategies. And you can see there, it got a lot of attention at the time and has really formed the foundation of our work to date. Next slide, please. Um, so again, you, we have a task force um, that is led by Charles Kamen and Shale Mangy um, that are focused on those same areas, developing an evidence-based um, education of workforce uh, and patients, workforce diversity and support, making sure that our, our providers who identify within the LGBTQ plus plus population feel well supported, um, addressing quality of care and certainly advocacy issues. Next slide, please. So the primary focus right now is on SOGI data collection and SOGI stands for sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, we have completed a um, quantitative survey to understand the prevalence of the current collection of SOGI data in the clinical in clinical care and research. Um, ASCO does have another um, data set called Cancer Link, where they did look to see if they could identify transgender individuals through the mismatch of um, gender, which right now is unfortunately just administrative male-female, but where there might be a mismatch between male-female and um, disease site a diagnosis. So if you had a female patient that had been diagnosed with prostate cancer, was that in fact a transgender individual or was it an error in, in the record? And unfortunately, they found that that wasn't a, a successful way of really bringing uh, transgender individuals out of out of the dark there. Um, so continuing to focus on um, SOGI data collection and how important it is, um, not only externally in the research, but also with our own customer management system. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as noted, we are um, we have completed that online survey. It was administered in the fall of 2020 to better understand barriers and facilitators of SOGI data collection. Um, the uh, results of that were presented in um, at the ASCO annual meeting. There were two abstracts. One was just in the Ed book, but one was presented as um, a poster session. And we're just wrapping up and hoping to get that manuscript uh, published of the quantitative findings. We are um, we have received funding, uh, very fortunately, and are going to be undertaking a qualitative portion of this uh, to conduct site interviews to really, again, kind of get into what are those barriers or facilitators? What sort of leadership buy-in do you need? What are the, uh, just the simple barriers of the technology of what needs to happen in your EMR to make that information um, available to the clinician um, so they know who their patient is when, when they walk in the room. Next slide, please. 
And I, I love to share this quote from Dr. Lori Pierce, uh, noting that we do not have all of the answers for reaching equity. Um, and it's not about having the answers, but rather posing the right questions and searching for those answers together. And this is a journey. Um, and I'm just, again, grateful to, to be here today. Next slide. Um, so if you have any questions, there's my email, and I would also encourage you to visit our website there, asco.org slash equity, where you'll see information on the, the projects I've highlighted today, as well as other um, resources that we have developed and continue to, to make available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeanette. This was an incredible presentation. I've learned so much. I'm putting in the ASCO link into the chat with everyone. Really appreciate you sharing your email. I am sure you're going to return to your inbox flooded, um, including Nord staff. There was so much you shared. We could have had a whole hour towards what ASCO is doing as a professional society, but it definitely applies well to the work that we're doing as many of our nonprofit organizational leaders work with other medical networks and professional groups. Um, so finally, last but not least, I would like to welcome to this webinar panel Ashley Ferreira, who has worked in Nord membership uh, as, a, as a former staff from a member organization. She uh, has moved on from her role there, but is her heart is with the rare disease community. We're so grateful that she is coming back to share with us some of her learnings and experience working with diverse populations. Um, her role previously was the program manager of outreach and inclusion at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Ashley, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Debbie, and thank you for that welcome. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure being here. And as Debbie had indicated, I formerly worked at the Immune Deficiency Foundation as the program manager of outreach and inclusion. And part of my role was to help lead our diversity, um, our diversity and inclusion efforts. And so as you can imagine, right now we are trying to reach out to different communities, especially those that are diverse and underserved. And so uh, there's a lot of steps that are involved in this. I think that a lot of times it's easy to assume that uh, if we want to help underserved communities, we just need to translate materials. We just need to uh, have events and people are going to show up. And as admirable of an effort as that is, the reality is if we're not targeting a specific audience, if we're not utilizing strategic marketing skills, it's probably not going to be effective. And uh, at the Immune Deficiency Foundation specifically, we wanted to start reaching out to the Hispanic community. So I work with the primary immune deficiency community. And so there are approximately 250,000 individuals with primary immune deficiency diagnosed in the United States. Uh, however, there's quite a few who are undiagnosed. And the reality is many of those individuals won't get the diagnosis that they need. On average, it takes anywhere from seven to 14 years for an individual with PI to be diagnosed. And that is if they are able to speak English, if they're able to somewhat navigate uh, the health system here in the United States, and it takes a long time. Um, but what about those individuals whose uh, first language isn't English, who maybe don't understand uh, certain materials because it's at a higher level in terms of reading level. So those were some of the factors that we needed to consider when we were coming up with our programming. So I'm gonna kind of go over some of the steps that we use uh, in order to come up with programming for these underserved communities and hopefully they'll help you. And I'm sure we'll discuss more in our breakout rooms which I look forward to uh, helping facilitate. So kind of the first step in all of this is identifying the audience that it is that you want to reach out to. So in a case that in, as a case study uh, with the Immune Deficiency Foundation, we wanted to reach out to the Hispanic population, right? So we knew that we wanted to reach out to them. And although we know that there are many barriers in terms of cultural barriers, language barriers, we really wanted to get an idea of the landscape. So a first step there, once you identify your audience, it's really trying to navigate that landscape, understanding it. So trying to set up discovery calls with members in your community, this can include physicians, this can include community members, trying to see how it is that they've interacted with other people in the target audience that you're looking at. Um, utilize your network, see what it is. Are there barriers in diagnosis? Is the barrier um, them not going to the doctor? What, it, what is it that they are having a hard time with? And that's really gonna help understand where it is that you need to start in terms of the type of programming that you're going to have. Um, and that kind of leads us to the second step in terms of 
looking, what is the channel that you're going to want to serve the community with? So what we decided to do uh, at the Immune Deficiency Foundation was to set up a virtual forum. It was going to be in person, but of course with COVID-19, unfortunately, a lot of our plans uh, were interrupted and we had to pivot a lot of our programming to virtual, but it was very wonderful because it allowed us to reach a more national audience. And so obviously we were looking at the Hispanic population. We were looking at where are, where are there more clusters? So we wanted to do outreach in California, Chicago, New York, Texas, different areas where we would be able to find some of these community members. Now, um, we realize a lot of individuals probably don't know what primary immune deficiency is, especially because it is a rare disease, right? And so when we were coming up with programming, we realized that it wouldn't necessarily attract many people if we created programming that was, if you're a primary immune deficiency patient, come to our webinar. We're going to go over what this is. That probably wasn't going to work, again, because they probably don't know what primary immune deficiency is. So we decided to pick a topic that was a little bit more general, that was more welcoming and would hopefully uh, be something that was a little bit easier to understand. So we created a education forum that went over a general overview of the immune system. Of course, we still wanted to tie it into our rare disease so that people understood how that fits into everything. But we wanted to make sure again that individuals felt safe or felt like they could come learn something out of this experience. When we were setting up this forum, we were hoping anywhere from 10 to 15 individuals registered, maybe five to eight individuals there. Uh, fortunately, we were able to have, I wanna say over 140 individuals register for this education forum, and it was extremely exciting. Um, how we were able to reach those numbers though, uh, a lot of it had to do with our step three marketing. So we used a lot of different channels to try to recruit individuals for this event, right? So we would look at um, Facebook, social media. We did a lot of advertising that way because we see that there are quite a few individuals who use social media, especially within the Hispanic community. Um, a lot of times we really have to think about that when we are looking at what uh, avenues we're looking in terms of market. So as a member of the Hispanic community, I can tell you that we really like our TV, we really like our radio, and we tend to use those avenues, uh, we tend to use those as our sources for information. And so when we were coming up with marketing strategies, how can we utilize those to our benefit? Now, being a smaller nonprofit, that probably wasn't in our budget at the time and we were starting off, but social media, Facebook was definitely a way to get out there. And so we were able to have a number of individuals register for this event, again, that was based on the immune system. So most of them tended to have an idea of what the immune system was. And we saw that there was a lot of positive response in terms of the comments and the feedback that we were receiving. Um, the caveat to all of this is that we got um, individuals register for this event who were outside of the primary immune deficiency community. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing because we were able to inform our audiences of a disease that was not there before, that they didn't know about before, I'm sorry. Uh, they now know what primary immune deficiency is. They were able to gain an understanding of the immune system and it created awareness. So this turned not into only an education event, but also an awareness campaign so that individuals were more likely to understand how it is the immune system ties into primary immune deficiency, what are some of these warning signs and so forth. So of course we implemented the event. It was wonderful. We had quite a few individuals there. They asked many questions. It was great for the community to come together. And again, even if they were not aware of what primary immune deficiency was, they now had an understanding of what it was. Some of them, they did come from this community. And so they were very excited to hear that they now had resources. Um, but we have a great event. We, it was wonderful. We had these individuals come. We now have uh, an audience that we didn't have before, right? but what do you do? And follow-up is extremely important in all of this, right? So even though we had an event that was successful, we were able to start creating an audience and that will hopefully uh, create other audience, uh, a larger audience, we have to make sure that we're following up in different ways. So one, uh, we already had re, uh, translated resources, which are very important. And again, it's great for nonprofits to have these resources that they can share with their community. But of course, if you don't have an audience, they're just going to sit there. So at this point, we finally had an audience, small but growing, right? And we were able to share with them 
either via email or via phone calls. Here are some of the resources that we have available to you. Uh, you wanna make sure that you don't stop communication with them. Again, that's always very important, right? You wanna make sure that they don't feel alone. Um, and we want to ensure that we can invite them to other events if you're planning on doing other things. Uh, what we did is we created a survey in order to understand what it is that the Hispanic community needed, right? So uh, we know, we have an idea of what our primary need efficiency community needed, but when it comes to a, uh, the, this subset of the community, there's different needs, right? So maybe they don't know how to navigate health insurance. You know, English isn't their first language, so they don't know what resources are available to them. Maybe they don't understand that they have to go see a specific doctor, in this case, an immunologist, in order to be treated. And so trying to understand what it is their needs and then gathering that information to adapt it into different resources, uh, that was definitely helpful. And fortunately, we were able to take some of that to the larger primary deficiency conference this past summer. It was great. We had more countries represented there. And it was wonderful to see that those from the Spanish speaking uh, organizations were able to see that they had resources, that they had venue uh, to be able to communicate with others. And it's actually very exciting that NORD is doing that similarly here by having interpreters, really allowing this community to connect in different ways. Um, so again, it's really about that follow-up, continuing to see what it is that the community needs and how it is that you can use different, uh, different channels to reach out to them. So with that, I know that we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the discussion rooms. I would like to pass it over to Debbie. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity, Debbie. Ashley, thank you so much for the time and for sharing all your learnings with the Immune Deficiency Foundation. They were very practical tips and a good understanding of how you would not just expect to build it and they will come. Um, so <laughs> there is so much to talk about. And it's the reason why we have a 90 minute webinar is that we want you to talk amongst each other and directly in smaller breakout rooms. Uh, again, this is Debbie at Nord. We just had a robust conversation about collaborations and coalition. We have nine minutes left and we have multiple breakout rooms. So each breakout room will have two minutes to give the highlight reel of what you shared. I'll start with coalition building, looking at the time. Um, we talked about coalition and collaboration. Um, building relationships is hard when you work with multiple rare diseases. We mentioned again and again that there will be an online toolkit that will more comprehensively go into how to get buy-in from your board of directors because you can't work on inclusion if your board of directors are not really sold on the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion. They won't put their resources towards the work. Secondly, um, it's overwhelming to do this work, but there are a lot of benefits to diversity, equity, and inclusion. For coalition building, um, let's see, resources are limited. I mean, we know there's a lot of challenges and obstacles. Um, medical societies work with uh, marginalized communities. ASCO has a DEI department. There are other medical societies that you work with. Um, maybe they're not rare societies, but if they're larger clinical areas like cardiology, pulmonology, uh, epilepsy, approach the medical societies, ask your medical advisors, for the coalitions for which they sit on. Also, if you're doing collaboration and trying to work with these communities that work with diverse, or these organizations that work with diverse communities, know that you should also be working with other rare disease organizations in your space and asking them who are their coalition partners, how are they working on inclusion so you're not reinventing the wheel. Um, and I think that's it. I'm gonna pass it now to my colleagues who are in the research room. Two minutes. Let's see. I can't see where you guys are, but if you want to come, there you go. Hi. Great. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie. I'm uh, with the research department here at NORD. Um, we had a really robust conversation about the challenges and opportunities of expanding diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. Um, one of the big things we talked about is, is the one way we can address designing inclusive clinical trials is to include patients in the design process and then to include them from the beginning, not just talking to these patient groups after everything's been decided, every, everything's intact, and then say, okay, please help us sell this, you know, to engage with patients along the way and to engage with the trusted partners. Um, uh, Jeanette had a great quote, and it was actually from another uh, co-presenter she had that, People don't listen to people who are paid to care. 
Um, and the reason why I love this is that it's not enough just to bring in an advocate to just be like, okay, I'm here to listen to you and to your concerns, but we need to partner with trusted community partners um, and you and utilize those relationships to help us build trust in the communities in which we're looking to recruit for clinical trials. Other challenges include um, just structural barriers where we um, put our sites for clinical trials. There's a tendency on the part of pharma, pharma partners to want to start to enrollment fast and cheap. So we go at high, high enrollment sites, which tend to be tied to academic medical centers or private practices. And these are not areas where you're gonna get a diverse population from. So, so partnering with other groups like community health centers, like senior centers may be helpful in helping to widen our efforts in clinical trials. Um, really uh, a lot to be learned from, from listening from other community partners and trusted partners and to um, work with other patient groups to understand the challenges they've vet, met and how they've worked to include those or to address those barriers over time. Thanks, Stephanie. Passing it on to Rohan. Hi, uh, I'm Rohan from Nord here. Yeah, another great conversation in the outreach and communications and marketing uh, conversation breakout there. Um, sort of with a lot of uh, conversation sort of around, uh, you know, how to connect, uh, you know, under, underrepresented groups, but overrepresented in disease populations. So there was some talk around, you know, uh, going over cultural barriers, doing discovery calls, sort of looking at the audiences you have um, and, and kind of consider the patient journey, what works for your individual audience, really listening to your individual community. A lot of good follow-up conversations and, and questions sort of about talking to physicians, um, talking to your community, um, sort of what position are you in to sort of take the step? If there isn't a DEI task force, if there isn't people communicating, what can you do to be the link between those groups? Um, and, you know, I think, I think there's also, I, I think as probably heard in a lot of uh, other breakouts, there's some challenges, some frustration. It's a long haul. I think uh, Laura from the, the Cystic Fibrosis shared that they started, uh, you know, working on their calendar 11 years ago. And it's a, it's a long process to sort of make the connections, make the contacts. You know, sometimes it's not uh, give them your information. It's uh, tell them to give, like, you know, sometimes it's not ask for the contact information. It's give your contact information. So they contact you, uh, sort of allowing that that uh, that conversation to, to, to generate and to, in a, uh, a more sympathetic or, or natural sort of way. Um, other good conversations and resources shared. Leslie sh uh, shared Readable, um, which is a resource everyone should look up. Um, uh, yes, I'm trying to think of his other key things. Really, it's about listening, I think, is a huge thing that we talked about with storytelling, accessing your community and collaboration. So I would uh, encourage everyone to, to just listen to what your community needs to hear um, in order to give people the support they need. We need to know what they need. I think Leslie mentioned that up top. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's some of the main points. I know I, I talked a little fast. So if anyone else from the, the uh, breakout there wants to share, they definitely can. In the chat. So feel free to use the chat function. I'm going to pass it. Thanks, Rohan, for that report back. Pass it to Dr. Yolanda Avon. Hi. So we covered a lot of topics because we covered, um, hopefully, I think all of them in our, in our room. But a lot of the things that you all have already said. So um, the storytelling was really important and thinking about how you can utilize stories from your organization. That is also a cultural foundation of communication of how to reach people. We talked about what if you don't have a lot of funds as a small organization and thinking about language translation. And so we put in the chat um, one of those resources, which is um, Translators Without Borders, um, which is, I think, a low to no cost resource for a lot of small organizations um, to be able to use. So thank you to Nicole um, for asking that question um, and then um, our interpreter for sharing that resource. We also talked about what does it mean to um, think about being transparent and honest about the distrust, uh, particularly that uh, people of color have around the system where you're talking about clinical trials. So it's talking about that information up front and providing very clear information education can be really helpful um, instead of sort of just hurting people to do something, um, explaining that. And so that can be really important. So thinking about what that looks like. Um, we talked about universal design. So as you think about accessibility of your resources, um, doing more sort of than the post and pray on the internet and hope people find your information, but thinking about um, what print media may look like, thinking about um, television, maybe partnering with your local public media 
um, organization in your state or in your area. Um, and sometimes they offer free to low cost um, advertisement for nonprofit organizations. Um, I know they do here in Virginia. So thinking about what that looks like. Um, in addition, um, thinking about um, your cultural roadmap, right? So as you think about your cultural roadmap and how you do these things, what are going to be the stop signs? What are going to be the yield pieces? What are going to be the go signs that you can do with little to no barriers? And then what are going to be the bridges you connect to other organizations? Nicole made a wonderful point when she said they worked on their coalition um, and they really wanted to um, create a coalition with people they could learn from. I think that's really important. What are going to be the windy roads and how do you prepare for those as well? So as you think about your cultural roadmap, um, use the key to help you get um, to best get to where you're trying to go. But again, don't stop. Keep going because it's not a it's not a destination. It's a journey. Ashanti, what did I miss? I don't think you missed anything. I think that was, yeah, that was a really great summary of what was discussed. So much. Sorry. Uh, we're at the time to end our webinar. We're sorry we started a little bit late, but we want to respect the 90 minutes that were dedicated from 2 p.m. to 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. I'd like to bring things to a close by thanking all of our speakers Dr. Avon, Ashley Ferreira, Jeanette Merrill for being with us today, sharing their case studies, inspiring us to take action and becoming a more inclusive community. This is just the beginning of the dialogue. We're going to do more. We will have a toolkit. Check your email at the end of uh, November, early December. And uh, thank you to our facilitators for helping to guide discussions today, for all those who tuned in and are here with us in this end of the webinar. Um, we are growing together. We're learning. There's challenges. We're here for you. Email membership at rarediseases.org. See you next week where we talk about your board of directors and um, let us continue to work together to create a world that is more diverse, inclusive, and equitable, as well as accessible in the rare disease community. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great and safe rest of your week.